How we doing everybody? Um, I'm kind of excited about this one. This is uh, gonna be a little vintage Coach Cook here. So for our first topic uh, lecture, the topics of interest lecture, I decided to, to, to take on something that I think probably affects everybody, especially every one of you at some point in your life. Um, and I felt like I could wrap a lot of different topics into this same um, header. So to get into it, we're gonna get into avoiding toxic relationships today. Well, not just avoiding toxic relationships, but also how to recognize and build healthy ones as well. So there's a lot of things that we have to unpack and be careful about when we start talking about interpersonal relationships, and especially when we start talking about dating relationships. Um, so let's establish some things right off the bat. Um, first, I am by no means an expert. I'm not a mental health counselor. I'm not a, a marriage counselor or a relationship counselor. Uh, I have been involved in some marriage counseling and, and you know, I've been in marriage counseling. I've uh, been involved in some cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and seen some other types of therapy. I've read a lot uh, of, of what therapists publish in their studies about relationships and what happens in relationships and mainly the red flags of things that go wrong. Um, so I'm by no means an expert and I don't claim to be an expert. Um, but I have some experience in this area and I have some insights on these things and, and there's a lot of things that I can see that are problematic uh, that, that tend to lead to very dysfunctional and unhealthy relationships. And these are things that some of, some of which are obvious, um, but others I think may surprise you a little bit, at least in the way that I'm gonna explain them and articulate them. So I want you to really kind of pay close attention to the things that we talk about and start to think, is this something that, that I've, been affected by in the past or have been guilty of in the past. So let's be careful how we tread, but let's also understand that I'm no, by no means an expert, nor do I claim to be an expert. Um, and the second thing is, is I want you to understand that, that this is my opinion and most research backs it up, that, that any relationship can, can be salvaged. Any relationship can be fixed. Um, it, it really, any relationship can come back from a vast array of toxic things that that affect it, even if it's addictions or physical abuse. And uh, you know, while I don't necessarily advise that everybody should try to solve every relationship, I do wanna put that out there, that, that your first step when you recognize some toxicity uh, in a dysfunctional relationship may not necessarily be to end the relationship and eliminate it and cut ties. Although there are times obviously when you do need to know when it's time to cut ties and end a toxic relationship. So I do wanna point that out that any relationship that has two willing parties in it is capable of, of repair. It can be fixed, right? Any, any relationship where there are two willing parties can, can really heal a lot of things. They can overcome a lot of, uh, of relationship flaws or toxicity. So let's get into first the idea of, of why we would even try to get into a healthy relationship to begin with. It's kind of something that seems silly and simple, but there, there are a lot of people that don't buy into the idea of monogamy or they don't buy into the idea of long-term interpersonal relationships. And they may wonder what would be the benefit of that rather than just living a life of somebody who's single and going from relationship to relationship. So obviously you have to be in the emotional and mental space where this is something that, that you want uh, to have as a healthy functional relationship. and. Um, a, a monogamous relationship between two willing, loving people is the most healthy way to have a relationship. Um, and so we'll get into the benefits of a healthy relationship, one of which is probably underrated at this point in your life, but it's something that you need to take into consideration, and that is genuine, actual intimacy. What intimacy looks like, and we'll get into that. Um, companionship. Companionship is better than being alone. Um, and it's not that everybody that's alone is isolated uh, or is lonely, but companionship of, of having somebody by your side to navigate through certain things, which brings me to the next one, which is just someone to share life experiences with. It's not just about support. It's, we're gonna, that's, you're gonna see that today as we kind of unfold this topic. The way that we tend to view relationships through our lenses are, are really the benefits that we gain from having a partner. And we don't really take into consideration the things that we have as a responsibility in a relationship. So if what we're filtering as a healthy relationship is only what I gain, from my significant other, from my partner, that's problematic right off the bat. So someone to share life with is not just for your benefit, but it's for theirs and it's to celebrate things together. But it also at times, of course, is to support people um, and enjoy something that is, that, is, that is joint, that is together. 
physical and emotional fulfillment. Obviously, we get into things like healthy sexual relationships. We get into things like uh, affection um, and healthy emotional relationships are definitely a benefit for your health, not just for your mental health and your emotional health, but even for your physical and physiological well-being. Comfortability. Uh, there's something to be said for a relationship that's comfortable. There are people that, that, that know each other well. They don't have the tension. They don't have the stress, the anxiety. There's something to be said for that in a relationship as a benefit of somebody that you can be comfortable with. Support, of course, again, we just mentioned that you're gonna support other people, but it's also nice to be in a healthy relationship when you can gain some support as well. And transformation into a better person. And this is one, again, that maybe we're not ready for uh, to hear as a critique, but when you find yourself selflessly engaging in a relationship, then you're gonna be transformed into a better person in the process, which is gonna make other aspects of your life um, more healthy and more functional. Um, and so if you wanna know how to become a better person, you look at the most selfless relationships you can have. You think about parents, right? You probably not parents, but you probably have parents and, and at least some parental model, whomever it was that raised you. And you can see that the selfless acts of love are what build these strong relationships, but they also build character and they, they, they build people into better human beings. When you have to do something genuinely selflessly, meaning you gain really nothing from it other than the satisfaction of taking care of and providing for somebody else, that's a huge mental and psychological benefit. It gives you a purpose, it gives you a fulfillment. So transformation into a better person is definitely one of the things that you would gain from being in a long-term committed relationship. Let's talk about the effects of a toxic relationship because we all know that toxic is bad. But let's talk about some of the effects of, of what are the long-term and short-term side effects of being in toxic relationships. And again, it may seem obvious, but I think what's not obvious is when people tend to think about the fact that um, in this short term part of your life you might underestimate just exactly how much of your life is of what your decisions you're doing now are going to impact you later on in your life okay so one of the side effects of, of toxic relationships of course is probably one of the more obvious ones that pops up is the potential damage for future relationships so as i was mentioning i think we can underestimate if we're not careful the long-term effects of our decisions and our behaviors. The things that you participate in now are definitely practiced for the future. And it doesn't mean that you can't overcome some of these side effects, but I just, I wanna make this blatantly clear. Whatever you're doing right now, whether it's your personal relationships or whether it's experimenting with drugs or whether it's good study habits, whether it's positive relationship techniques, it doesn't matter what it is, but whatever it is that you're doing on a regular basis is building habit, is building routine, is preparing you, it's showing you the negative model or the non-model. And when you actively and continuously expose yourself to toxic relationships, all you're doing is damaging future relationships. And that's not only gonna affect yourself and your own fulfillment, it's really not fair to your future partner either because you're gonna come into a relationship with a lot of damage and a lot of emotional baggage. So emotional baggage is not the same thing as damage to future relationships because you can damage a relationship without being baggaged. Right? Maybe you're the person who's toxic. Maybe you don't have bitterness or resentment, but maybe you're the person who's been the bully or you're the person who has emotionally taken advantage of other people or you've emotionally controlled people or psychologically controlled people by playing mind games. Right? So being a toxic person can also affect future relationships and not just the one that you're in. And we're gonna get into the healthy relationships, obviously, and one of those things is communication. And so um, oh, you have to be open with people from the beginning about the intentions of the relationship and what it is that you hope to gain so that you're both on the same page. So we can definitely damage our future relationships and probably are, right? All of the negative, bad things that you do in your relationship, if you're not growing and learning from those, they're really just building habits for your future relationship that you will eventually try to make work. Because even if you don't believe in monogamy and long-term committed relationships right now, you may at some point in your life, and then you're gonna to try to be in a healthy, functional relationship, and you're really not gonna know what that looks like unless you had a great model, right? So if you have a great model from your parents or whoever your caregivers are that you live with, and you see day-to-day -day healthy relationships, and even if you see that, you may have to overcome some of the emotional baggage that you created from the bad relationships that you're in. So let's make no mistake about this. As harsh as it sounds, good relationships are like anything else. They don't happen by accident. They take time and intentionality. 
And for some of you, you're gonna have to stop and evaluate if what you're doing right now at this stage of your life is really the best course of action for you. You might really need to be reevaluate at this chapter of your life, your stance on relationships and how you date and how you handle those dating relationships. Intimacy issues. Intimacy issues are a negative emotional side effect of being hurt or being wounded. And when you're in unhealthy relationships, even if they're not any fault of your own, it doesn't matter. We're not placing blame. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. But when you're in toxic relationships, for better or for worse, even if you didn't see it coming, you're going to have to overcome the fact that you're going to have intimacy issues in the future. You may have intimacy issues in the future. And that's going to be difficult for you to get close to people again. You're not going to let people in. You're going to be guarded. You're going to be emotionally closed off. Disappointment, right? Relationships are one of those things where we're vulnerable. There's things that we want, things that we're looking for. And we tend to become disappointed with our partner or we tend to become disappointed with the process and we, we give up on uncommitted relationships, which are a big part of our personal life. And so if you can't have a healthy functional relationship, you're gonna struggle in your personal life with disappointment. I like this one is anger and resentment. You tend to be bitter. It's about the opposite sex or you may tend to be bitter about a certain profile or type of person or you may be bitter about the process of dating just in general. So there's a lot of self-reflection that needs to go on here. It's not just, oh, you're the victim of someone else who's toxic, which is what everybody always thinks. And you may not be toxic, to be fair, but you may have to recognize your part and your responsibility in this. This, this one I, wa I wanna talk about specifically, there's different meanings when I say frustration. It can certainly be sexual frustration. It can be, um, um, you can be affectionately deprived, right? You're frustrated because you don't have an affection level with your significant other that's healthy, um, and you might be craving that. You might kind of reach out for that, and, and again, that leads to bad behavior sometimes because then you seek attention from other people, and you seek affection from other people, and then you do dysfunctional, toxic things like cheat on your significant other or have emotional affairs, right, or just completely shut down. And so being unfulfilled or being frustrated is a definite side effect of a toxic relationship. Trust issues, again, this goes in with the intimacy, but it may not just be in the romantic relationship. You may have a hard time trusting people when they tell you something, that they're telling you the truth, or that they're gonna hold up their end of the bargain. Self-esteem issues, and this is one that's underrated and people really don't think about it. If you have body image issues, or if you have self-esteem issues, one of the long-term, I'm gonna call it an erosive effect. It can be erosive. Um, when people emotionally damage you continuously, for their own gain or for whatever purposes, maybe they have their own problems and baggage, that can tend to erode away at your own self-image. The way you feel about yourself, the way that you hold yourself, um, the regard you have for yourself, the way that you view yourself. You may think that you're unlovable, you may think that, that this is the best you're ever gonna do, you may think that you don't deserve to be loved in a certain way, and that's an example of a cognitive distortion. And that's a type of distortion that's known as learned helplessness, obviously. That that's a type of self-esteem issue that you can get from being in a toxic relationship. And hopefully, it's something that can be worked on and can be reversed. An unhealthy view of love and sex. So not just the frustration from not experiencing healthy physical intimacy or healthy affection, but you may also come to have this toxic view or a jaded view of sex. There's definitely a, a healthy uh, format for sex to take place between willing participants who are emotionally committed to the relationship. See, sex is supposed to be about intimacy. It's supposed to be about things that you share. And in fact, it, you've probably heard me say this before, sexual intercourse is the, is the most intimate thing that two people can do with one another. So to turn sex into something that it's not is really problematic, right? It's really problematic. So people try to downplay the emotional side effects of a sexual relationship and they say, oh, well, they're putting too much on it or they putting it on a pedestal, or it's something that they need to uh, uh, you know, look at a different way. But the reality is, is that sex is an emotional thing. It involves intimacy, it involves oxytocin, it involves uh, emotional connection. And it's something that is, that, that's not to be played around with, right? It can leave damage, it can leave scars. And so an unhealthy view of sex and definitely an unhealthy view of love are something that can come from a toxic relationship. So. Let's talk about the foundational things that I want to say here, okay? Let's look at what healthy relationships look like. We'll define them. And then we're going to look at the opposite of those traits of what an unhealthy relationship looks like. And again, I'm not going to put this about people, toxic people. 
we're talking about toxic relationships. So it doesn't have to be intentional, like somebody's intentionally playing mind games with you, but it could be something where the relationship is just dysfunctional and unhealthy, and people need to recognize these things when they come up. So healthy relationships are, are, are built on a foundation of three things, okay? They're built on a foundation of trust, they're built on a foundation of communication, and healthy relationships are built on a foundation of sacrifice, and that is a type of commitment that some people just may not be ready for at this point in their life. But if that's the case, you need to realize that these are kind of the, the tenets, the pillars, if you will, of a healthy functional relationship. And if you're not ready or able or capable for whatever reason, even if it's because you're wounded, then it may be very difficult to have a healthy relationship because it needs to be founded on trust. It needs to be founded on communication. It needs to be founded on sacrifice. So let's talk about the, the foundations of a toxic relationship, right? So if we're built on trust, communication, and sacrifice, and that's our operational definition for, for a healthy relationship and what it looks like, let's look at the opposite. What are the foundations for a toxic relationship? Deceit and suspicion, right? Deceit and suspicion. The second foundation for a toxic relationship would be emotional isolation. Emotional isolation, the opposite of communication. Right? So if we communicate and talk about our feelings and lay those things out, the opposite of that would be to be isolated emotionally without communication. And the opposite of sacrifice being selfishness. And that's something that might be triggering for some people because selfishness is problematic. Selfishness is something that it, it comes and goes and we're all guilty of it. It's not necessarily like a personality trait, but it's something that can definitely contribute to the toxicity of a relationship, even in just certain situations. All right, so let's talk about trust for a second. We're going to break the three down. And I'm going to get into the, 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 the healthy side of things and the unhealthy side of things. Right? So if you want to jot some things down or if you want to take note of this, we're going to start with what the healthy relationship is, is founded upon, and that's a, a foundation of trust. Okay? Establishing trust means, healthy, means establishing healthy boundaries. Okay, so I want you to tune in for a second here. This is probably not something that you've thought about or considered before. And if you have good for you because you'd be advanced. It's definitely not something I thought about when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, or even 20 years old. When you enter into a healthy relationship, you have to be willing to establish healthy boundaries. And I don't just mean boundaries from the other person, like, oh, she's too clingy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about boundaries outside of the relationship. And this is important, don't tune out. Some of you might just roll your eyes when you hear that. Things have to change in some of your other personal relationships when you start a committed, healthy relationship. Because here's the reality. If you're starting a committed, healthy relationship and it doesn't affect or overlap any of the other personal aspects of your life, it's probably not a very deep relationship. And I know, before we go too far, we have to address the, the whole mentality of, well, you're not supposed to hang out with your friends too much, or you've replaced your friend relationships with your significant other. And I'm talking about a balance. I'm not talking about you eliminate your friendships, or you forget your friends, or you forget where you came from. That's not what I'm talking about. But in reality, as a friend, you should be supportive of the fact that a healthy, intimate relationship fulfills a role that a friendship is not designed to fill. And that's just factual. That's just reality. So if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but that's the reality of the situation is that there should be something that's missing in a friendship that exists in a romantic relationship. So when you want to talk about healthy relationships, you have to establish boundaries. And sometimes that means discussing difficult things. And some relationships aren't ready for that, especially if you're early in the relationship. People don't want to say what they're thinking. They don't want to say what they're feeling. And so they don't bring things up that bother them. And the longer you let them go and the longer you let those things fester and stay inside, you grow to resent the other person and all of a sudden you're upset that they didn't just suspect it and see it. Well, they should just want to change. Well, the reality is, is that people have to hear things from a place of love. They have to hear them from the people who love them and they have to hear them in a way that's loving. So let's talk about boundaries. Let me think about how I want to phrase this. It, it is not a ridiculous suggestion or request for your significant other to ask you to consider very seriously your co-ed relationships, your opposite sex relationships, right? Assuming you're heterosexual. So let's say for instance, if, if, you, if you are a guy who starts dating a girl 
and she's uncomfortable that you have so many friends that are girls, there's obviously a happy way to balance that. But there, there, there is a, something that you owe to this relationship and this person that says that she's not comfortable with some of the interactions that you have. And out of respect for a relationship and a commitment for a relationship that you're trying to make work, you need to be willing to establish some boundaries there. And you can't, you, well, let's say you can, you can be, you can be angry about it and you can be recalcitrant about it and you can be willing to say, well, sorry, she's just going to have to deal with it. And well, I'm sorry if that's the way she feels, but this is just reality. These are my friends. These are the people I know. You can't ask me to stop hanging out with my friends. Well, that's a red flag, my friend. When you start out a relationship where there's some animosity about the people that you hang out with, you're going to have to evaluate the status of the relationship. And if you want the relationship to continue and you want to make it work and you're committed to that, then you're going to have to be willing to establish some boundaries. And yes, it definitely means establishing boundaries within the relationship as well, right? To prevent people from getting too clingy and to prevent people from completely pouring themselves out into the relationship and not getting anything back. So they're just going to mindlessly and blindly follow you and all of your goals and all of your hopes and all of your dreams. And they're not going to have their own life or their own hopes or their own dreams or their own friends or their own relationships. You got to establish some boundaries. Boundaries are healthy. Boundaries are healthy between parents and kids. Boundaries are healthy between teachers and students. Yep, write that one down, right? Boundaries are healthy. Boundaries establish what's okay and what's not. And one of the ways that you establish trust with a person who, who you're intimately involved with is by showing them that you're willing to create some boundaries for the sake of the relationship. And don't do it in a resentful way. Don't do it in a way that says, fine, I'll do that because you don't want me to. Or because you want me to, but I don't want to. Right? So let's transition that into the next point for trust. The importance of being able to communicate how you're feeling. Now this one's kind of deep also. Here's some free therapy for you. Okay? You should never, in an in a, in a interpersonal relationship, you should never feel anxious, nervous, or guilty about expressing how you feel. Okay? So let me say that again. You should never feel like you can't tell your significant other how you're feeling. You should always be able to share your feelings judgment-free. Now, it doesn't mean they're always going to agree with it. Sometimes you're going to be angry at your significant other, and the feeling that you're sharing is your anger or frustration. So there's definitely a way to do that, and we're going to talk about that when we get into communication, the do's and don'ts. But you have to be able to to express your emotional feelings without judgment, even if it's not something that your partner's ready to hear. So if you go to your partner, let me think of something that's like a really intense conversation, and you tell them, listen, I've had problems with attraction for this other girl, we'll say. That's a heavy thing for somebody in, in your relationship to hear. But if you keep that a secret and pretend like it's not the case, what's it going to do? It's going to erode the trust in your relationship because it seems like something you hide. Because the truth has a way of making itself known. So out of respect for your relationship and your love for your partner, you need to be to feel like you can communicate your feelings. Now let me say the other side of that. If your significant other comes to you and they share with you how they're feeling, you cannot judge them for how they're feeling. Shame on you for that. Now, where the conversation goes from there is what do we do? How do we fix this thing together? And that's the back-to-back -back part of a relationship, not the face-to-face, -face, right? And we'll get to that when we get into communication, the mindset of like when you're blaming other people for your problems and the type of language that we use, right? Whether we're using accusatory language, which is offensive, which is ca causes people to be defensive, Right? That's just a, a ticking time bomb from the beginning. So we'll talk about communication and how to communicate these things. But I want to express how important it is that you feel comfortable sharing how you feel. And if you go to your significant other with all of this fear and anxiety and you're just like, I didn't know how you were going to react, but I just really need to share with you how I'm feeling. They should support and love you for that. They may not be happy about your feeling. I can definitely tell you that I or anyone else would, would not be happy to hear their significant other tell them, I, I'm struggling with attraction to somebody else. But the fact that they're coming to you and telling you that basically means that this is something they're trying to work through. This is something that they don't want to give into. This is something they want to make you aware of. So being vulnerable in a relationship and building trust means that you have to be willing to be open about how you're feeling. 
And going back to the boundaries, if you, ladies or guys, doesn't matter who it is, if you don't feel comfortable asking your significant other to establish a boundary, that's a red flag. So you need to be able to tell your significant other, listen, I, I'm worried that you're not gonna wanna hear this or like this, but I can't help but feel the way I feel. And I feel like your relationship with this person is inappropriate. And they may get defensive, but they can't blame you for how you're feeling. Let me say that again. People's feelings are judgment free. You can't help how you feel. If you go to your significant other and tell them, hey, this is how I'm feeling right now, they're not gonna blame you and say, well, how dare you feel that way? Because if that's their response, I think you got an issue right off the bat. That's an example of a toxic trait. If somebody chastises you for a feeling that you're having, and the fact that you were honest enough to bring it up, that's problematic. And I'm not saying people don't do that. I'm just saying you need to evaluate when somebody's willing to be open about their feelings, that you're gonna be supportive enough to help them deal with those feelings in a way that both of you are together back to back. So it's not their problem they're feeling that way. No, 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 no. It's your problem as a couple that they're feeling that way. And that's something that you need to address and overcome. And only, only people inside of a relationship know when it gets to the point where maybe you need to seek professional help. Maybe you need to, to seek counseling or something like that. But there's definitely no shame in that. You just have to decide when it's the right time. The third bullet point about trust. Fostering trust helps to avoid resentment and suspicion. A lot of toxic relationships are built on suspicion. Again, if you don't create boundaries and that person is hanging out with a significant other, or I'm sorry, if your significant other is hanging out with someone else and they're going, let's say uh, they go and hang out with somebody and it's a group of friends and maybe you're okay with that, but maybe they go off somewhere and they go uh, have coffee and they want to talk. If you're not okay with that as a significant other, that's right, that right there is a barrier to trust. And you need to feel comfortable sharing with your significant other, like, look, you may not have meant anything by this, and I, I think maybe it was harmless, and maybe you didn't even realize, but the reality is, this is how that made me feel. And again, if that's the language you use, it's not fair for people to chastise you for your feelings. Not in a healthy relationship anyway. So where you go from there is communication, but you have to feel comfortable sharing your feelings. You're building trust when you do that. You're establishing intimacy and trust. Because if you don't, if you hide your feelings, you're going to resent your significant other. And you may even become suspicious of what they're doing. And if you hide and bottle up your feelings, your significant other might become suspicious of you. Well, he's acting really distant. He hasn't really talked to me the same way. I haven't really heard that he's not being affectionate with me. He's not doing those little cute things that he usually does. He's kind of icing me out. Those are all forms of suspicion. So rather than letting those fester and turn into resentment, what you should do is go back again and, and feel comfortable expressing how you feel. Hey, I can't help but feel like you're really kind of icing me out. I can't help but feel like you're upset about something. And we probably need to talk about that before it becomes a bigger issue. Now, you don't want to accuse them and say, well, I'm going to start to resent you if you're not honest with me. But we all know that can happen. When you build trust, you avoid suspicion and you avoid resentment. And a lot of people become resentful and bitter in relationships because they don't ever get their emotional way. They hold everything inside and they don't share it and they build it up and it bottles up and then someday it explodes and, and, and we're arguing about something that's not really what we're arguing about because it's, been, it's built up. That's toxic. That's the literal definition of toxic because it's toxic to your body to hold that kind of stress in, to repress it, right, as Freud would say. So you have to establish boundaries which is gonna avoid suspicion and build trust. You have to share how you're feeling, right? Which is gonna, again, build trust. And basically, you just understand the benefit of that as being something that prevents resentment and suspicion from building up. And finally, establishing that you are, that you are trustworthy. So it's not just about what that person can do for you, but that you're a trustworthy partner in this partnership is a way, <coughs> excuse me, for you to build intimacy. It's a way for you to actually show a sign of love to your significant other. It's a form of, of affection to prove to them that it matters, that they trust you. I trust you. Now again, there's, there's a limit to that. There's a limit to that. 
blindly trusting people that you're suspicious are doing things and they're taking advantage of you. Again, that's toxic. That's not healthy. But that's why we need to build that trust. You have to think, if I'm suspicious of my boyfriend or girlfriend, even if you feel guilty about it, when that thought first creeps into your head, the first thing you need to do is grab a hold of that thought and analyze it. Well, that's interesting that she said she was here, but actually she's over here with her friend, and I know she is because of Snapchat. When you first have that thought, you need to grab that thought and you need to say, why am I suspicious of this person right now? Have they given me reason to be suspicious? Why would they not be totally honest? Is it because it's just easier to lie or is it because they have something to hide? In either, either case, that's a toxic trait. So don't let these things go. Catch them. Catch those thoughts. Analyze those thoughts. So establishing that you're trustworthy is a way to build intimacy and show love for your partner. So I like this metaphor, right? Let's think about this metaphor. Um, uh, it's like these ping pong balls here, okay? I have this container full of ping pong balls. So if you think about, this is like a long relationship. Every one of these ping pong balls is an incident. It's something that we share together. It's a trust building moment. It's an experience, right? So just like drops of water in a bucket, oh, that one got away. Just like drops of water in a bucket, right? Every single experience that you have when the significant other is a way to build trust. And you build this foundation of trust. There's a lot of trust in this relationship, but it takes a long time. One shared event, another shared event, and you're building up this trust and relationship, right? But all it takes is one bad behavior, one misstep in a relationship just to pour all of that trust away. All of that time and energy that you spent building up and filling up this relationship, this foundation of trust can be spilled out with one act, one cheating incident, one emotional affair, one lie, one time that you got caught bad-mouthing them to your friends behind their back. All of these hurtful things that people can do, whether they mean to or not, can spill out a lifetime of trust. And then what you have to do is you have to slowly build that back up, one incident at a time. And so the relationship can be salvaged. We can rebuild this trust, but it takes a lot longer to build trust than it does to lose trust. So that's something you have to think about, right? Cheating is not just cheating. It's not just an action. It's not just a behavior. You're actively choosing to do something that's going to pour out months and months of intimacy building and trust foundation in your relationship. That's something that you have to think about, right? So you can't just say, I made a mistake. Well, not all mistakes are created equal. That's why you have to really evaluate the situations that you put yourself in. And again, just to go back to the first one, that's why establishing healthy boundaries is such an important thing for you to do. Then, then it makes it less likely that in a hot emotional state where you're somewhere else and maybe you're intoxicated or not in the frame, right frame of mind anyway, and you're getting caught up in an emotional conversation and the opportunity arises and you're not thinking about your significant other or all of that trust that you built up and you feel guilty and terrible and you go to them and talk to them and share your feelings, but you're still going to have to build all that trust back up because that's a hurtful thing to do. And it's really difficult to overcome infidelity. It's difficult. Trust is a hard thing to rebuild. I'm not saying it can't be done, right? Any relationship with two willing parties can be fixed, but it's a difficult thing to overcome. It's a difficult thing to overcome. So you have to really set healthy boundaries so you don't put yourself in a situation that you're not in control. And you can play, play the victim all you want to. You can, tell, you can tell your significant other, well, I didn't mean to. I put myself in a situation, but it got away from me. I didn't mean to. I didn't love that person. It wasn't like I wanted to hurt you. It doesn't matter what your intentions were because your, your, your actions speak louder than your intentions. Your behavior speaks louder than your intentions. Regardless of what you intended to do, this is what you did, right? And how you avoid that is understanding that you're human and that you're vulnerable. Right? I've been married for 12. Tomorrow's my 13th anniversary. I owe it to my spouse, my wife, my partner to establish healthy boundaries so that I don't put myself in a situation where I'm going to be apologizing for my actions later on. That's something that you do. Right? And if you're not ready for that kind of grown-up adult relationship, then you just need to stop. You need to go back and sit at the kids' table. Because if you want to be in a healthy, functional relationship, that's, the, that's what it requires. Right? And that's just the first one. That's trust. Let's get into the second thing. Communication. What does healthy communication look like? Let's talk about healthy communication. Honesty about your emotions and your point of view, right? Honesty about your emotions and your point of view. That's a little bit of what we talked about with trust. Avoiding accusatory language like I statements, 
and using things instead like our, uh, you say I statements and avoiding you statements. Opening yourself up to healthy dialogue about disagreements and not emotional fights. How I feel is different than what I think. You can't let your emotions do your thinking for you, right? Just like thoughts don't take the place of emotions. Emotions are not reasoning. They're not logical. And finally, and this one is important. Some of you need to make sure you're sitting down and paying attention for this one. Are you ready? Do you have a pen? Okay. Edifying and supporting your partner with your speech. Let me tell you the second half of that in case you can't read it. It says, do not ever use words intentionally to hurt or to wound your significant other. Words are not our emotional weapons. You have to decide going into a relationship that we're back to back in this thing. Partners in crime. Day ones. Best friends. And you know what best friends don't do? They don't use words as weapons to wound people just because they're angry and they can. When you're in a relationship long enough, you learn people's buttons. And if you're a person who's gonna use words as weapons and then you're not careful and you're in that hot emotional state where you can't control your anger and your rage, you're out of spite and out of an actual genuine desire to do nothing more than to hurt the other person, you're gonna go there and push that button. And just like a nuclear button, there's no going back once you push that button. You have to maintain your emotional state. And that comes with healthy dialogue, right? So let's start from the beginning and work our way through this. Healthy communication. Healthy communication is not emotional, it is rational. Healthy communication is not emotional, it is rational. We're having rational conversations. And in a lot of cases, it's proactive rather than reactive, just like good parenting. It's not, oh, my son will never come home in a cop car. It's what am I going to do if slash when my son comes home in a cop car? Because if I don't address the reality of a situation, then when that situation does come, it's going to catch me by surprise. And guess what? I'm not being logical because guess what? I am being emotional. You can't parent emotionally, even though it's really, really hard. I have my three kids and it's really hard. And you can't emotionally replace logic in your discussions with your significant other. It doesn't matter if you're angry or if you're sad. And if you're sad, being sad is not more righteous than being angry. Being sad is not a more righteous emotion. You can't say because I'm upset and I'm hurt, my feelings matter more than yours. You're sad and he's angry. Both of you are in an, in, in a, in an enhanced positive emotional state right? Or you would be in a negative emotional state and he would be in a positive emotional state. But both of you are away from homeostasis and you're not logical. So honesty about emotions and point of view. Again, that goes back to building trust. You have to be honest with people about how you are feeling. And I know it's, it, it, you're scared to try that. But when, when a conversation starts to get away from you and you start to say the wrong thing and the person's getting upset and you're getting upset and you're matching intensity for intensity, just hit the reset button. Hit the pause button. And have a moment of honesty where you say, you know what? This has gotten away from me. I'm starting to get emotional. I did not mean for this to play out like this. Don't say things that you don't. Don't say, I didn't mean it. Well, you meant what you said or you wouldn't have said it. And even if you didn't mean it, it doesn't matter. Just like I said in the last slide, your actions right, are more significant than what your words are or your feelings. Oh, I didn't mean to hurt you, but you did. So if it gets away from you and you lose control of your emotions, you need to be willing to hit the reset button. And you need to be willing to say, this conversation is getting away from us. We need to stay logical. And sometimes that means, sometimes the most logical, healthy thing to do in a disagreement is to walk away from the discussion and come back to it later. And a lot of experts would say, don't go to bed angry, right? Don't go to sleep and not talk to each other till the morning and it's going to affect your sleep. And so I, I get, I buy into that. I'm not saying that's false, but I'm assuming that there's going to be some time separation where both of you can go somewhere and you can cool off. You can think logically instead of defensively, like you have to be right all the time and you're not being emotional, you're being logical. And then when you come back together, you can say things like, listen, I thought about it and you're right. Or even if you don't think they're right, I thought about it and I understand where you're coming from. In fact, I know why you would be so passionate about this, but there's some things that you need to consider. That is a different 
way of discussing things than getting into an emotional explosion. And that takes a lot of maturity. And let's be honest, some of you don't have a lot of maturity. So there's some personal growth that's gotta happen before you can be in a healthy relationship. Or maybe you're dating somebody that does not have a lot of maturity. There's some personal growth that they're gonna have to be willing to undergo before you can have a healthy relationship. So communication is healthy dialogue. This one is important. Accusatory language, this is gonna sound silly. You gotta bear with me on this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something that you may not have heard and it's gonna sound really corny and cheesy, but I promise it works. When you use offensive language, not like, oh, that's offensive to me because of my people. I think it's a prejudiced thing to say. I'm saying it's offensive because you have gone on the offensive. You are in attack mode. When you say something offensive, the natural response for the person who has now been accused of something is to do what? If you said defend themselves, then you would be correct, sir or ma'am, right? When you say offensive things and you go on the offensive, the natural tendency for that person is to defend themselves. It's just like if you're in court, if somebody accuses you of something, you have the right to defend yourself and defend your innocence. So when you get into an argument or a verbal engagement with your significant other and you immediately accuse them of things, what is the expectation of what they're gonna do? In fact, the fact that you don't expect them to defend themselves shows how dumb you are. When you say offensive things, people are going to get defensive. It's like someone verbally swinging at you and you're supposed to just take that and be like, this rage is coming from somewhere, I can tell. Emotions are not logical thoughts. And it's not just emotional. When we accuse our, significance of, our significant others of things, that's hurtful and it's wounding. So don't say, you always do this to me. Because not only is it an absolute statement and a cognitive distortion, it's clearly not accurate, but it's also offensive. It's accusatory. So you have now made a blanket statement by using the word always, and you've accused them of something. They have no choice but to defend themselves. And now the conversation is already away from you and no one will win. When you start a conversation with an accusation, there's no way that you're gonna win because you are the accuser. And now they've been put on trial and feel the need to defend themselves. So either party, both of you, whoever's listening, do not use accusatory statements. Tell people simply how you feel about what they did. And it may be fair, you cheated on me, is a true statement, maybe. But it's not gonna gain you the same dialogue as if you tell them accurately and honestly how it made you feel when they cheated on you. Because now, you haven't accused them of anything. When you accuse them of something, they're defending their actions. But when you tell them, the result of their actions and how it made you feel, not only are they not defending themselves because they haven't been accused, now it's basically put the ball in their court to respond. Okay, this is how it made me feel. Instead of saying, you always do this to me when we get around your friends, you need to use the same statement about your own feelings. I just feel like every time we get around your friends, you tend to do X, Y, or Z. You have to be really careful how you phrase these things. I know it, sounds, it doesn't sound very different, but, but focus your phrasing on your feelings. When that happens, this is how that makes me feel, right? So if they do something, even if they're guilty, don't accuse them of an action and then force them to give you some kind of rebuttal about why they did it because it's not gonna be satisfactory. I did it on purpose because I'm mean and I wanted to hurt you. Thanks for being honest, but that doesn't help. But no, they're not gonna say that. They're gonna get defensive. So instead, you should stick to how people's actions and words make you feel. If somebody says something horrible about you on social media, your response should be, did you think about how that would make me feel? This is how it felt when I read your comment. And now you're not accusing them of something. I mean, you are, you're putting them kind of on trial because you're implying that it's their actions. But just the mere language, again, I know it seems cheesy, I know it seems silly, but by saying, this is how I feel about that. We're gonna go back to the previous with the trust thing and the conversation. People are not allowed, or let's say it's unfair for them to judge you how you're feeling. It's unfair. So even if you're being unreasonable, you're still being honest about how you feel. 
So maybe, and again, you don't have to always apologize because your emotions are your business. You don't have to apologize for your emotions, but if you know that you're being ridiculous or if you know that you're not right, you still need to be honest about your feelings. Just say, look, I know you've never given me any reason to suspect that you would cheat on me, but I just, I felt suspicious and I don't know if I'm just being weird. And you know what they're going to do? If you phrase it that way, they're going to probably lovingly reassure you. They're not going to get defensive. If they do, they're immature. If someone faults you for being honest about your feelings, shame on them. And you need to evaluate the maturity of the person that you've entered into a relationship with. If you're both not ready to have a mature back-to-back -back adult relationship, that it might be a toxic person. They may need to do some growing. You don't just kick them to the curb, but I would, I would be weary of that and start to evaluate whether or not that gets better. And you need to be able to have these conversations. And again, don't you're not mature enough for me. Some of you are thinking that literally as you're hearing this and as I'm explaining to you about not using accusatory language, you're going to show this to your boyfriend and be like, this is you. You're immature. Hello? Have we not learned anything here? Okay. You be honest about your feelings. Don't accuse people of things. Just tell people how you feel. And that's going to steer your dialogue in a healthy way. We're not going to use accusatory language. We're not going to use, you always do this. We're going to say things like, I, I felt like that was a betrayal. Is different than you betrayed me. It's the same thing, really. The semantics of it are the same. But the language is not accusatory. It's not an accusation. So think very seriously about how you're going to phrase things. And sometimes you have time before a conversation, and you don't say, you really hurt my feelings, even though that would be honest. And they may not react negatively, but there's a better way to phrase that. You could say, my feelings were really hurt. I felt sad. That's an honest thing. People can't say, well, you're ridiculous. You shouldn't have. And if they say, you shouldn't have felt sad, you don't say why. You can say, maybe I shouldn't have. But that's how I feel, and I'm being honest about my feelings. So either I'm being ridiculous, or there's something we need to discuss here. And all I'm doing is sharing with you how I feel. But again, some of you won't do that because you're so immature that it actually turns your stomach up to think about having a real adult conversation. It seems cheesy and abnormal, right? And finally, again, let's get into this. We've talked about healthy dialogue. We've talked about not being emotional. We've talked about being proactive instead of reactive. But we need to talk about this. It's very important that you commit at the beginning of a relationship to each other, maybe verbally out loud, that you're not going to use words to wound one another. Don't do it. Don't do it. And it's sometimes people make themselves an easy target because here's what you're doing. When someone is emotionally, emotionally vulnerable with you and you take advantage of that by hurting them intentionally, that's sadistic behavior. So if you lack the maturity to protect someone who's feeling vulnerable and sad, and they're opening themselves up to you, or even if they're being angry with you, if you have a button or a trump card that you've been waiting to pull and drop down and go, remember that time you cheated on me and we never talked about it? Here we go. And that's why it's important that you're always open and that you talk about your suspicions and that you use eye language and you talk about your feelings and you bring it up and you establish boundaries. You don't hold it in, you don't resent it. You don't accuse people of things in an emotional fit. You keep it civil, you keep it logical, even if you're too emotional, you say, I'm not, I'm not really in a good emotional place to have this conversation right now. Just try that. Try that one time this week. If you get in a fight with your significant, over, uh, your significant other over something petty and stupid, just use the phrase, especially if you're typing it, I'm not in a good emotional place to have this conversation right now. And they may respond, well, I want to have it right now. And your response to that needs to be, I understand that. But I want to have a logical conversation and not an emotional fight. And if they respond to you with, well, I want to have an emotional fight, that tells you what you need to know about them and their maturity. And all you say is you just keep deflecting. All the more reason that we don't need to have this discussion right now. I just need some space. Nothing to worry about. I'll contact you in an hour when I'm feeling better. People are going to respect that even if they don't admit it. And if they don't respect it and if they don't understand, see, immature people don't understand maturity. And some of you think you're mature, but you're not because you don't know what maturity looks like. So of course, if you don't know what maturity looks like, you think you're mature. So immature people don't understand a mature point of view. I didn't, I was immature for a long time. It was, I was virtually incapable of having a mature relationship until I was in a place in my life where that was something that I wanted to really do well at. 
and work at. And that came from meeting a person that brought the best out of me because she was a selfless, sacrificial person, which is what you do in, in response, which is the reciprocal response, right? Which brings us to our last point, the sacrificing part of a relationship. A relationship is not just about benefit. It's not just about what you get. The relationship is about two willing parties that are participating in something that's very fulfilling. But it's not about what they can give to you. We're kind of overlapping with the Rockstar Manifesto, uh, day four, love it, uh, myths and misconceptions here. But you can't just be in a relationship for the benefit of what you gain. Because then it's just take, take, take. It's a one-way relationship. That's more like you and your mom. She just continues to give and give and give and give and put a roof over your head and try to keep you from God knows what, getting syphilis and pregnant and, and fights and dropping out of school and all of these crazy things that you want to try to do and because you're self-destructive and again, immature probably. Definitely not you, right? All these things that your mom does for you and you just continue to take and take and take and take and take because it's a one, one-sided relationship and at some point, and you're very close to that point now, you'll reach a maturity where you realize all the things that your mom did that helped you have the life that you have and you'll appreciate that and you'll feel guilty and you'll build this friendship type relationship with your mom. That's what healthy parent parent child boundaries look like. And if parents don't create healthy boundaries, back to the first slide, healthy relationships have boundaries. And if health, parents don't create healthy boundaries, then you resent your parents by the time you move out of the house. Not try to partner with your parents by the time that you move out of your house, right? It's the same thing is true in personal relationships or romantic relationships. None of this is, is, is false for even a friendship. A healthy friendship looks the same as a healthy dating relationship. It's based on trust, right? Intimacy it may not be physical affection or sexual intimacy, but it's intimacy nonetheless. Relationships have two parties. They aren't just a vending machine for your gratification. You have a long, hard day, and you go home and just hit A7, and your significant other just, just, just gives you, you know, thoughts about things that make you feel better, and they, you know, give you physical affection, and they tell you that you're right all the time, and they constantly just edify you and not the other way around. Relationships and significant others are not vending machines for your self-gratification. If you're only in a relationship for what you can get out of that relationship, you need to reevaluate how the other person is feeling. And again, how do we avoid this? That significant other that you're taking advantage of should feel comfortable sharing their emotions and feelings with you. I feel as if I'm constantly being taken advantage of. And if you get triggered by that, it's because you're not emotionally mature enough to see that this is a one-sided relationship. And you're not going to listen to your significant other when they tell you this is a one-sided relationship. So when the relationship gets rocky and the two of you can't do it, you need a mediator. Probably not your ratchet friend who's just going to side with you every time anyway. You need an actual third party who's going to tell you things and you're going to listen to them. And you're going to have to accept it as fact or you're just going to walk away from the relationship because you can't be reasoned with. Right? So there's a certain level of logic and maturity that's involved in a relationship anyway. And again, part of that, again, I, I, I try not to make it about personality traits and toxic people because I don't want people to think that you're the victim all the time. I don't know why I have so many toxic ex-boyfriends because you're a horrible judge of people. That's why you have so many toxic ex-boyfriends because you keep dating them. Self-advocacy. You need to advocate for your own emotional well-being and understand the side effects of toxic relationships. And you need to recognize the warning signs and you need to practice good communication and try to build trust and intimacy and establish boundaries and use actual communication techniques of logic and, and, and feeling. And you're honest. And if that person doesn't reciprocate any of that, then maybe they need to go. So if you continuously find yourself in toxic relationships, you need to start evaluating yourself, which is what this portion of the third part of a toxic relationship and a healthy relationship is all about. Toxic relationships are selfish. Healthy relationships are selfless. Not all the time. There's a time for you and there's a time for your significant other. But it's not your time every time. You have to really pick and choose your battles and pick which is most important. Like, yeah, I want, just to give you a married example, I want that color shower curtain. But do I care that much? Do I care enough about the color of a shower curtain to get into a fight about it? If your significant other clearly cares more about it than you do, then that's something that, that's not a battle you fight. You let them have it. Because you don't care that much. If, if you're not careful, you can fight about any and everything that's possible. You're gonna disagree on things. It's okay to disagree. And these couples that tell you they've been dating for like four hours, and they're like, no, we never fight. Well, that's, that's horrifying. 
It's horrifying. If you never disagree with your, your partner, either you're dumb or they're dumb or you don't share anything or they don't share anything or both or all of the above. Can't wait for this time bomb to explode, right? That's not a good thing. Oh, we never fight. The hell does that mean? You don't ever talk about anything? Of course you fight because there are things worth fighting about in a relationship. There are things worth dialoguing about in a relationship, but there's a healthy way to do that, right? A healthy way to do that is communication. So some of that is self-sacrificing, being willing to give up things that you don't care that much about because it's a way of supporting your partner. So two parties, not a vending machine. The second thing is roles versus benefits. There are benefits that you get from being in this relationship, but you also have an active role in this relationship. And sometimes when the benefits dry up, you're like, well, that person, and you become a victim. Well, maybe you need to look at yourself in the mirror and go, am I holding up my role in this relationship? Maybe your significant other is dealing with something really stressful at this point, and your role has now become the supporter. And you're going to have to carry that, bro. You're going to have to be willing to support them. Because at some point, you're going to need support, and the roles are going to be reversed. They're going to switch. This whole idea of toxic masculinity and femininity and the cult of domesticity and these traditional gender anybody in a healthy relationship can tell you that the roles are constantly reversed there's no fight over who's the man and who's the woman in a healthy relationship there's no competition in people that love each other because that's not what love looks like love is sacrificial sacrificial it's something that someone does for the betterment of a person outside of themselves Self-transcendence, as Maslow called it. You did that because you love somebody, not because you wanted to. It's easy to do the things that you want to do, ladies and gentlemen. It's easy to. I'm not talking about what restaurant you want to go to. Someday you're going to have real problems in a relationship, like should I go to this college to be closer to him, or should we move to this city? Should I take this job or not? Should I buy this car or that one? And you're going to have to be selfless enough to make a value decision based on the health of the relationship and consideration of your significant other. And there are grown adults who've been married for a long time who fail and neglect to do that sometimes. We all do, but we need to be reminded of this. Your relationship has benefit, but it also has a role. And sometimes when the benefits dry up, you have to evaluate, am I playing out my role right now? She needs me to be X, Y, or Z. That's what I need to be because that's what she needs. Because here's the reality. Listen in close. If you can't be what she needs you to be, that means she's going to have to get that somewhere outside of your relationship. And I don't mean sexually. I don't mean physical affection, but it could be physical affection. I mean, if you can't emotionally support your significant other, then that means that you're not enough for her. She's going to have to find additional emotional support. Not because you can't, because you're unwilling to. A little tough to hear. I know that's a little tough to hear. So roles versus benefits. When is it time to let something you want go to support your partner? You have to think about that. Is it my turn to give something up so that I can support them and their wishes? Having a servant's attitude. Again, people don't think servitude. Submitting to the will or the, the, the want of the other person. Having a servant's attitude. Getting real gratification from supporting your partner's goals, your partner's needs, your partner's desires, your partner's wants even. This is what she wants, or this is what he wants. And sometimes you just give them that because you love them and you want to sacrifice for them. And finally, picking your battles. Like I mentioned before, determining what's more important. Is it more important? Sometimes you're right. Sometimes you are factually correct. But you have to ask yourself the question, is it more important for me to be right in this scenario? And sometimes it is. Like I said, you, you're going to fight in, 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 in healthy relationships. There are things worth fighting about. I'm not saying you let everything go. I'm not saying you become a pacifist of love. I'm saying you pick the battles that you want to fight. There are mountains that are worth dying on and causes that are worth dying for. But not everything that you fight about is worth fighting about. You pick your battles wisely. And when you do disagree and you do have a disagreement or you do have a battle, you fight fair, you don't use wounding language, you're open about your feelings, you create healthy boundaries, you establish and maintain that level of trust, and you gratify and edify them, and you use logic instead of emotion. And at any point in your relationship, when this gets out of line and gets out of whack, because it always does, the relationship is not over, thing, toxins have begun to seep in. 
So when the toxins begin to seep in, we need to see them, and catch them, and we need to eliminate them, right? So again, let me end by wrapping all of this up. A healthy relationship is based on a foundation of trust, it's based on a foundation of communication, and it's based on a foundation of sacrifice. And if at any point any of these phases don't work out the way they're supposed to, toxins are seeping in, we need to catch hold of that and recognize it and address it before it becomes a much bigger problem. All right. Hopefully this wasn't too much to handle. And again, I don't think it's not necessarily the goal to end toxic relationship. It's just to recognize toxic traits in yourself or maybe in other people. And hopefully you can avoid those in favor of more healthy relationships and more healthy traits or even switching to healthier things inside of your own relationship. That's the goal.